on the video. Good morning, Grace Blue Ridge family. Hey, everybody. Oh, man, it is so good to see you all this morning and just to hear you all just talking with one another, fellowship, community. Oh, man, it is just, it's good for my heart, just fills my heart up. So thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to our visitors that are here for the first time. It's good to see you and to have you here. Um, a couple of reminders about connection. So the staff this week has been just talking and praying about kind of the, the vision moving into the summer, and we're really, really focusing on community and connection, because I think over the last year and a half, that's been the thing that suffered the most, because you could still worship, you could still learn and do discipleship in all the other ways we did church over the last year, but community really suffered, and so we are very committed to reconnecting that. So in the coming weeks, you're going to hear more about opportunities to do that, whether that's potlucks or cookouts or activities, just to be together as a church family. But in the meantime, it is so good to see you just talking to one another and hugging each other in the foyer, man. It just is good stuff. So if you are not on our weekly email list, which is the way you know about what's happening and how to get connected, then I encourage you to fill out a connect card. There's some in the back of some of the chairs. Um, they're also on the table out in the foyer. Or you can use the Church Center app and fill it out online. Also, if you haven't downloaded the Church Center app, I invite you to do that. It is the easiest way to stay connected with all the things going on here. And it's the way to check your kids in for children's ministry now. Um, next Sunday, we've got a lot of stuff going on. It's Move Up Sunday for our elementary age kids. Yes. Um, the, and I guess our middle school and high school kids, too. That's awesome. Um, so everybody's moving up into a new classroom based on the grade they're going into. Um, also, we are starting new classes for the summer, and we have a really great class uh, for the fourth and fifth graders, and we just need three more people who are willing to take one Sunday over the summer to lead that class. They're going through Pilgrim's Progress and doing some fun little activities together, and it's kind of, it's not a commitment, an ongoing thing, it's just a one-off kind of deal. So if you're willing to do that one time over the summer, please let Kim know so we can make that class a go. Um, but we will have children's ministry from babies all the way up to fifth grade starting again next week. We have a congregational meeting after the service next week where we are opening our deacon and deaconess nomination period. Um, we need to recruit some more to our awesome team, and so we are going to be doing that. So plan on sticking around for a few minutes after the service next week if you are a member. And there's a video that's coming out this week on our YouTube channel that's kind of explaining what is a deacon, deaconess, and what do they do. And so you can be thinking about who you would like to nominate for that position. Also, the youth are going on their summer mission trip, the high schoolers, next week. So please pray for them. This is going to be a very busy week as they're preparing to do that um, for their families, for the youth leaders, for, for Devin and for Katie. Just lift them up in prayer extra this week as they prepare for that. We are also kicking off Feed the Need, which is our summer local outreach initiative where we provide food, um, breakfast, lunches, snacks for food insecure families that are in our area here. So I think we have 12 family, 11 or 12 families that we're supporting. So and I saw some of you already brought in your, your goods. They're out there on that table. We're going to have a special email that goes out this week that gives you more details. But for now, um, if you want to bring donations for that, you can drop them off there in the lobby. Also, box packing. We need volunteers who will pack the boxes and volunteers who will deliver the boxes. And Deb Patilla, which is, where are you, Deb? Are you in here? Yep, right back here. Um, she is heading that up for us this summer, so she'll be out in the lobby after service. You can chat with her, and if you want to go ahead and sign up to come and pack boxes, that'd be a great help. And it's a really a great chance to connect with one another, too, like as you're doing service together. Um, the following Sunday, June 13th, we're having a welcome home lunch for our friends Katie and Derek, who are back from their work um, in North Africa. So we'd love for you to join us for that special luncheon. Um, do need you to register, though, so I have food for you. So you can do that on our website or on the Church Center app. Um, VBS registration is now open, which is exciting. That's coming in July. So if you have kiddos that would like to participate in that, go ahead and sign up. And lastly, we want to get kind of our fellowship hour started. That would be like the hour before service starts uh, for just to have coffee and pastries and just time to talk and hang out in the lobby. So we need some volunteers to help make that happen. So if you're willing to make coffee and set out some pastries, please grab me after church and I will um, talk to you about how to get that going. We'd love to launch that very soon. 
Okay, I know that's a lot of announcements, but it's exciting to have things happening and to be able to share them with you. So let me open our service with a prayer. And if, um, if what I read just resonates with you, I invite you to join me in a congregational amen. By the fire of your spirit, O oh God, forge us into one church, many and different people, but together in Christ's embrace. Set our hearts aflame with a love for the truth, and the desire to do your will, that our witness to Christ may burn brightly in the lives of joyful discipleship. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, and then we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church. Gracious God, may we who have received your grace live in the unity of your Holy Spirit, that we may show forth your gifts into all the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. And the congregation says, Amen. Amen. Good morning. I invite you to stand as we uh, worship together. Uh, my name is Derek. Please join me as we uh, start through Scripture. <clears throat> I'll start us out. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord, because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down, and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement, and worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Sing the verse again. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust sweetest frame but only trust in Jesus name Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm he is Lord Lord of all When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high stormy gale, my anchor holds within. Shall come with trumpet sound, 
from Christ That soul can set Bound by everlasting bands Once it held In Him forever Thus the eternal covenant's dead None shall take thee From the strength of His right Heirs of God, join us with Jesus. Long and tight, it's a race begun to His name. Eternal praises. kids can be dismissed for discipleship. There's not discipleship today, I'm sorry. On autopilot up here, it's up to you now. <laughs> Good morning. It is great to see everybody's faces. It, it's amazing. Our central text for today is Haggai, chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. 
Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labors. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. If you don't know me, my name is Steve Holliday. I'm one of the pastors here. Glad to see all of you. You can help me out a little bit this morning. We've kind of changed our, uh, we're in the process of changing our camera angle, okay? And so I'm only supposed to move this far, (laughs) all right? So if I go over here, then just kind of remind me, okay? And the same way over here, just kind of remind me you're out of range, okay? Great, thank you. Happy Memorial Day weekend. This kicks off the summer, right? Time to, time to get out on the, on the water, right? For those, you know, you have your favorite flotation device, your air mattress or your tube or whatever you get out on the lake. Now, this probably happens to you, right? You, you get out there and you're floating and you're all relaxed and your eyes kind of closed and you're just taking it in and you're just floating and it's great and then you open your eyes and it's like you know where am I how did I get here you know that's happened to you it's easy to drift away from where we want to be right now can any of you relate to this kind of drifting. I, sp- I spend too much time working and not enough time with my family. I, I don't want to do that, but... <sighs> I spend too much time on social media and there's other things I should be doing, cleaning the garage and homework and, or housework and whatever. Um, I know I should be helping my kids with their homework, but... I just kind of get busy with other things. Or maybe I know I should be more invested in the things of the Lord, but I just get busy with other things. Right? It's easy to drift away from where we want to be. And a a huge part of our fallenness A huge part of being sinners is that we are always drifting toward self-centeredness. And it is so easy to just go with the flow of our current culture's self-focus. And even as Christians, it's easy to focus on, on me first. My house, my pleasure, my glory, my stuff. That's that's the natural bent of a sinful heart. Is this resonating with anyone? Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, right? Now, of course, we have excuses for all of that, for that drifting. We have excuses, and we have really good excuses. And, And we could actually crash and burn clinging on to our excuses, couldn't we? But the Lord is gracious, And he comes along, like this morning, and he speaks to us. He speaks right into our situation. And and he wipes out all of our excuses. Well, you know, I, uh, no, he goes. Yeah, except for, uh, no. Yeah, yeah, no. But the Lord is gracious, and he graciously redirects us. He takes us and he sets us back on course from our drifting. And he recalibrates our internal compass so that we're headed in the right direction again. And that's what Haggai chapter 1 does. It does this very thing. Important passage. Maybe we should listen to it. Let me lead us in prayer, okay? Lord, We don't acknowledge how much we need you this morning. 
we do drift. Our hearts are prone to wander from the God that we love. Our hearts are prone to to wander away from, from the path that we know is the path that you have called us to. And sometimes we feel helpless. But Lord, would you come along today and would you give us the word and give us the strength that we need to hear you and to be corrected? And most of all, Lord, would your name be exalted in this place? Amen. So since we started off with a water metaphor, let me do another water metaphor. Those of you, a lot of you have been on rowboats, right? Rowboats, okay. Interesting thing about rowing a boat. Or is it, how's it go? But the interesting thing is that you sit in the boat and you're looking backwards to go that way, aren't you? That's what we're doing this morning with the book of Haggai. Haggai, a prophet from 2,500 years. So we're looking back, hearing the words from 2,500 years, looking this direction to help us move forward. That's what we're doing uh, in this series. Uh, Chaz kicked it off last week. We're calling it Returning to a New Normal. And I want to recap a, a couple of historical markers that Chaz mentioned last week. So now, again, going way back, 586 B.C., Israel went into Babylonian captivity. Then in 539, King Cyrus of Persia then captured Babylon. One year later, as Chaz mentioned last week, Cyrus made an edict For the people of Israel that were in Babylon, go back to Israel and rebuild the temple. Two years later, a group of Israelites started rebuilding that temple. But about four years later, the rebuilding process had completely stopped. They weren't rebuilding the temple anymore. Ten years later then, after that, the Lord gives a message to the prophet Haggai for the people of Israel. That's what we're looking at this morning. And basically the message was, what about the temple? Why did you stop rebuilding it? So that's God's message found in verses 3 to 11. But before we get into verse 3, we need to back up to verse 2, we need to hear the people's excuse for not rebuilding the temple. And here's what the Lord says about what they said. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. So God's question basically was, why aren't you rebuilding the house of the Lord? The people's answer was, well, it's not really a good time right now. And then in verse 4, the Lord's follow-up comment is, so it's not a good time to build the temple, but it is a good time to build your own house, right? And that's what we have then in verse 4. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins. Now, paneled house, it means one of two things, and scholars disagree, but either it's talking about the luxurious wood, okay, talking about how nice the houses were, or it's simply talking about paneled as being the roof, which means they finished the roof and basically the house is now finished. So he's either saying, you got really nice houses, or he's saying, you know, your houses are finished, right? So I want you to imagine this situation then. So Haggai gets some of the people together, and he says, you know, let's just take a a little tour here. Let's just walk around the neighborhood. Zerubbabel, nice house you have there. Love the patio. Joshua, very nice, nice, nice little gardens. I like, you know, I like that. Caleb, Rebecca, nice, cute little bungalow. Love what you've done with the place. 
And then Haggai says, you know, let's, let's go see the temple. And you go, and you look at the temple, and it's like, and they went, well, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, actually, the reason for that, I mean, I mean, you see, we did have the, right? And the Lord, he blows through all the smoke and all of the excuses. Now, they were really good excuses. Chas mentioned the, the, the reasons. They were good reasons why they didn't rebuild. But what he does here. The Lord comes along with this message through Haggai, and he presses his thumb down on the real issue. I know you got all your excuses, all your good reasons. He presses his thumb on the real issue. The real issue is, my house is not built because you have been busy with your own house. Somehow, Israel had gradually drifted away from where they wanted to be. Now, now why? Why? Why did they drift away? Two reasons. And this is the outline. Finally, we finally get to the outline. Okay, two points. Number one, this is why they drifted away. Number one, they overestimated the value of their own houses. And number two, they underestimated the value of his house. And the outcome of that is... My house gets built, and his house doesn't. Now, how can that possibly happen? Hmm? Maybe we better listen. So, point number one. Whoops. They overestimated the value of their own houses. Now, Chaz had a prop last week. Does anybody remember the prop from last week? Well, I thought I would try to compete with that. Now, there's children in the audience today. Last week, maybe a good thing that there wasn't children in the audience, you think? So maybe this prop is a little safer than his prop last week. But we are talking about houses, so... Let's think this through. Why does a person build a house anyway? Why don't we just live outside? Why don't we just live in the corner? Why don't we just live out in the woods? Why don't we live in a tent? And as we answer that, we realize that a house is more about doors and windows, and it's more about a roof and carpet and and all of that. It's more about just those things. We realize that a house is about comfort and about safety and about protection. We build a house maybe for our own pleasure and maybe for our own glory. Look where I live. Or we build it for stability, right? A sense of groundedness, a, a sense of settledness, and a place for family. Our house is our domain. It's our little kingdom. It's our, it's our headquarters. It's our control center for living our lives, right? And that's really important. And God knows that. And he knows that we have those needs and he wants to provide those needs. However, Israel, they made their house a priority without God. They made their comfort and safety and pleasure and security and settledness and family and the living of life, they made that a priority without God. Well, I mean, we we have to take care of our needs first. I mean... We have a family here, and this is critical, so we have to do that, and then we'll pick up the God thing. And our culture basically reinforces that thinking 100%. Robert Ringer, New York Times, number one bestseller, he wrote a book called Looking Out for Number One, subtitle, How to Get from Where You Are Now from Where You Want to Be in Life. And here's what Robert Ringer writes. Looking out for number one 
begins with the belief that you have a moral right to take actions aimed at giving you the greatest amount of pleasure and the least amount of pain, provided your actions do not violate the rights of others. It's easy for Christians to drift when that is the priority that is all around us. Take care of yourself first. Now, I know, I know what some of you are thinking. Well, self-care, right? Self-care. I have to be healthy first because if I'm not healthy, then I won't be any good to anybody else, right? So I have to take care of myself first. The whole airplane thing, right? You know what I'm talking about? You know, the oxygen masks come down, and what does it say? Put your own oxygen mask on first before you, right? Now, the problem with that is here's, here's what we do. Oxygen masks come down, and we take the oxygen mask, and we go. (laughs) Israel had been back in their land for 18 years and still no temple still adjusting the mask right building a house without god building a life without god has consequences and we're going to look at those in just a minute but when israel did that They overestimated the value of their own houses. And if you are putting anything above God, anything or anyone, you are overvaluing that thing or that person. Now, keep in mind, and this is important, Israel, these people, they did not forsake God. They they didn't walk away from God. They were still being religious. They were still trying to be faithful to the Lord. They didn't think that they were building their houses without God. They didn't think that. But because they built their houses first without building the temple first, they were obviously missing something. And that's why God sent a prophet. They were missing what Psalm 127.1 says. Let's let's read this together, okay? You want to read this with me? Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. They overestimated the value of their houses. Secondly, they underestimated the value of his house. Now, there were three things that Israel must not have understood. Or maybe they forgot. Maybe they knew it at one time and they forgot. But there's three things that were missing. So we'll call these three missing things. You thought this was just a two-point sermon, didn't you? (laughs) I got you. Three more points. Point number one, this is what they're missing. They were missing the real meaning of the temple. Now, more than anything else in this magnificent structure that had been the temple. More than anything else, it was the place that housed the presence of God. God was there. Remember when Solomon completed the temple? We read a little bit of it this morning. When Solomon completed building the temple, a cloud filled the house. And what was it? It was the glory of the Lord. It was his presence. The Lord's in the house. Now, for the Old Testament saints, the temple, the building, the building itself there, that was the center of worshiping God. It was the place where you met with God. It was the place where God forgave your sins. It was the place where you brought your offerings It was the place of prayer. It was the glory and the presence of God. He dwelled there in that building. That's how it was back then. And while 
the Israelites were in Babylon for those 70 years, they were missing that. There was a big hole in their religious life because they did not have the temple. But now that they have gone back to their land, that should have been the priority, right? Ah, we can go back and have the temple. Now, um, David, David understood that. In his day, he understood that. Look what, look what 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 7 says. Here's what David says with, in grief. I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. Just the opposite of what we see in Haggai. I got a really nice house. And what's God got? He's in a tent. We need to build a temple. Now, the temple was not just the center of religious life. It was the center of all of life, all of life for Israel. And that's the second thing that they were missing. The second thing is the connection between my house and his house. I miss that connection. The temple was not just about the temple was not just about worship related activities. The temple was about all of life activities, everyday things. It flowed out of the temple because the temple was about God's presence, and God's presence governed all of life. Today we might say, you know, it's not just about Sunday, it's also about Monday through Saturday. That's how we might say it today. God's presence governed everything. They're eating, they're drinking, they're sewing of clothes, their employment, their family, sex, building a house, and the growing of crops. The Lord governed that. The amount of rain that came down, the whole economy. And by the way, most of this passage has to do with talking about the economic conditions, doesn't it? Did you notice that? So in verses 5 and 6 and 9 and 10 and 11, it talks about not having enough rain, not having enough crops, not having enough food, not having enough clothing, not having enough employment, not having enough money. There was an inflation and there was economic downturn. And then verse 9 makes a direct connection between those conditions and the fact that the temple had not been built. Look at verse 9. You looked for much and behold it came to little. Big crop but you didn't get much. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. The people didn't make that connection. They didn't make the connection between the temple and the everyday. They didn't make the temple between, make the connection between his house and my house. And isn't it what we do a lot of times? So we do that same thing. So on Sunday we do the God thing. And then Monday we jump in and we start to do our thing. We do our thing. As if they're not connected. But they are. So the people missed the real meaning of the temple and they missed the connection between his house and my house. And there's one more thing that they were missing. The third missing thing. Something bigger is being built. Something bigger is being built. Now, as we go on and read further in the weeks ahead in the book of Haggai, we are going to see that something big is going down. Something big is going down. In fact, it's cosmic. Now, let me give you just a quick preview. So I guess this is a spoiler alert for the future weeks. But uh, just, just a few little, uh, little things here. Just a little preview. Chapter 2, verse 6. In a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth. 
Verse 7, I will shake all nations. I will fill this house with glory. Verse 22, I am about to destroy the strength of the kingdom of the nations. Wow. Something big. Israel had no idea what was coming. And they had no idea how important the temple was in that whole process. It was so important in, every, in all that was happening. Now, I want us to take just a real quick survey uh, of the temple, real quick, from Genesis to Revelation, of what God is doing, this big thing God is doing, and how he is building and transforming the temple, and what that means down through the ages and all of time, okay? So, Genesis to Revelation in a couple of, in a couple of minutes. So, now... What I was going to do is I was going to put the beginning, Genesis, way over here <laughs> and move along. And that's how I was going to do it. But now I'm not going to do that. So now the, the, well, I'll start here. Okay. The first temple was the Garden of Eden. That's the first temple. God was present in the garden with Adam and Eve. All right? The second temple was the tabernacle, that tent. God was present with his people. He was in the tabernacle, was with them as they journeyed through the wilderness. Okay? Now, next is Solomon's temple. This is a structure now that was built, Solomon's temple, and the glory of the Lord filled it. This was in the temple that Haggai was to rebuild. Okay, then, hundreds of years, Jesus, Jesus, who is the very presence of God, comes. The Word became flesh and what? Tabernacled among us. Okay. And then, Jesus himself enters the temple building, the structure. Jesus does. So interesting. And says, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. And what's he referring to? His body. So the, Jesus' body is the temple. And so then that happens. The temple is, dis, is, is destroyed. It goes into the ground. And the temple then is resurrected after three days. And it ascends into heaven. And the Holy Spirit is sent. And now the Holy Spirit comes and dwells. And now we are the temple. And as the church, we become a spiritual temple of God made up of living stones, right? And then Revelation 21 says, and I saw no temple in the city. This is the end, Revelation 21. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, and we will worship in the presence of the Lamb forever. Wow, okay. There you have it, Genesis to Revelation. A lot happening, a lot to take in. But there, out of all of that, there is one thing that we, we've got to see, and that is the temple is all about God's presence with his people. That's what it's about. So while Israel was looking out for number one and building their, old, their own house, that's what God was doing. That's what God was doing in his world, something big. And he's still doing that. He's still in the building process. He's still doing something big until the earth is filled with his glory. Now, you see, God's presence, his presence is about big. His presence is about creating and about expansion and about building and growing and filling, right? Think of Genesis 1 and what we're told to do, right? Building, growing, filling. That's what, that's what God is about. But anything that we build in this world on our own without God will only shrink and shrivel in time. Just like their crops and just like their bank accounts 
eventually it falls in. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. So what do we do with all of this? Well, we haven't even mentioned the key verse in this passage. In fact, this is the key verse in the whole book of Haggai, which is verse 8. And the key action step to be taken in this whole book, verse 8, and that is basically, go build the temple. That was the message. Go build the temple. So what does that mean for us today? Well, let's go back and fill in those three missing pieces. So first of all, here's the first thing. Here's what it means for us. His presence is always the priority. Always. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Always the priority. Do you remember that story in Exodus 33? Um, the Israelites, uh, the Israelites made golden calves to worship God. They made golden calves. Remember that? And the Lord got really angry with them because they did that. And he said to Moses, okay, you can go ahead and take your people into the promised land because I promised you that, but I'm not going with you. He was angry. And remember what Moses said? He said, well, if your presence isn't going, then I'm not going. I'm not going to go anywhere, and I'm not going to do anything if you're not present. He got that. Point number two, there is no lasting building project without him. No matter what you do or what you build, you got to do it with him. And then number three, be a builder in the big thing that God is doing. All right, there's three things for us. And you look at that and you think, yeah, it's kind of vague. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like for you to fill that out a little bit. You fill it out. You, you look at those three things and you figure out, what does that mean for you? All right, what are you going to do with that? Now, maybe you say, well, thanks for the sermon, Haggai. Love the sermon. And that's, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. But, you know, I'm, I'm a looking out for number one, building my house first, sinner, drifter kind of guy. Well, here's a word of hope for you. For those who are looking out for number one, build your own house, sinner, drifter kind of people. Here's a word of hope for those of you who come to Christ and who believe in him. Jesus will never drift away from you. Jesus will never go do his own building project and forget about you. He is our safety. He is our security. He is our comfort. He is our stability. He will never do his own building project without you. In fact, his building project is you. Jesus, who, remember, was the very presence of God, somehow had, his very, had the very presence of God stripped away from him. That's hard to comprehend. Jesus is the very presence of God, and yet the presence of God was taken away from him. He was forsaken by God, and he did that for you. His temple, his body, was destroyed, put into ground for you. He was raised up on the third day for you. He ascended into heaven and then put his very presence in you. Wow. He really came after us, didn't he? Let me close with, with Psalm 16. Uh, you know this verse from Psalm 16. In your presence, Lord, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. Now, what that means is we will be filled with joy 
when we go into his presence. But I, you know, I think there's more to it than that. Uh, a, a few weeks ago, I was at a wedding. And at the wedding, there were, there were two, phot- two photographers. So the bride comes down the aisle, and all the eyes are on the bride. And photographer, f- photographer number one is going click, 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 click. What's the second photographer doing? Camera on the groom. Click, 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 click. Wanted to capture his fullness of joy. Wanted to capture the expression of joy on the groom's face. God is looking in eager expectation, in joyful expectation. And who is it that's coming down the aisle? You and I coming down the aisle. A bunch of clumsy, awkward sinners. A bunch of looking out for number one, building my own house first, sinner drifters. Redeemed. Stumbling down the aisle of life, but slowly being perfected, slowly being built up. And that's the building work that we are called to do, and that's the building work that God is doing in Jesus. We praise him for that. Let's pray. Lord, help us understand these words. A lot lot happened there in that sermon Give us the faith to lay hold of it. We can never obey your word on our own. We need you at work in us, and that's what you are doing. We praise your name for that. Amen. I invite you to stand as we close together in worship. I will lay my worry down. I will lay my worry down. Turn my face up to you now. I will lay my worry down. Oh God, would you keep my peace? My mind is set on you. Let the anxious fear release. Let me hear your voice too. I'm a child lost in the field. Good Father, bring me out so I can rest here in your arms. Let your mercy find me now. And I will leave my worry down. I will. I will lay my worry down From the rising of the sun In the dimming of the day I know whatever comes You are my hope and stay So where else would I go For no one else can say you crushed the power of hell You have arisen from the grave so I will leave my worry down. I will leave my worry down. Turn my face up to you now. I will leave my worry down. Dark is the night. Deep is your love, great is my need, you are enough. Dark is the night, deep is your love, great is my need, you are enough. So I will lay my worry down, I will.
Great job, Derek, and Derek, and Derek. <laughs> Great job. Truly, thanks for all of you for being here. It's so good to see all of your faces and being back in God's house and this new normal. Um, I feel led today we need to start back to a new normal. Um, maybe a couple of elders, will, myself, maybe a couple other elders are available. We'll be here to pray for you if you need any kind of prayer. Also, I want to just remind you all the different ways we can give. You could give online. We've got the offering box in the back. And then last thing I want to share with you, hope go and check this yourself. It feels like a revelation, but listening to Steve, I was listening to our podcast this week, and recently you guys know the challenges in Israel and the rockets being fired and all that, and part of what precipitated some of that was um, potentially looking at building another temple, and one of the things I remember hearing is that, you know, seven is always a sign of God's perfection. Well, if you count the numbers that Steve said, plus if there's a new temple built, then the, our ultimate temple right in heaven would be seven, which would be perfection. And that just feels profound and just affirming we live in very unprecedented times right now. And praise God that uh, we're alive during this time. And so we are the church, and it doesn't stop today. It's what we bring out into the community the rest of this week. And what do people see in us, and do we draw them to Christ because of Christ living in us? So thank you again for being here. I'll leave you with this benediction. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Thank you.